we uh, live in an era, or so scientists, policy makers and statesmen like to tell us, when the environment is under threat in a way that it has never been before. Changes in climate, largely induced by human activities, could render large areas of the earth uninhabitable. Now I don't mean to deny the threat or to underestimate its scale, but I do want to question whether the so-called environment of scientific and policy discourses is one that human beings or any, any other creatures have ever inhabited. For what these discourses present to us is not the world we know from our everyday experience. Literally, of course, an environment is all around the person or organism whose environment it is. It's the phenomenal world that we perceive with our senses, including the earth beneath our feet, the sky arching over our heads, the air we breathe, not to mention the profusion of vegetation powered by the light of the sun and all the animals that depend on it, busily absorbed in their own lives as we are in ours. I'd like to take you all outdoors into the open air to remind you of this, since here, inside this lecture theatre, it seems to be something we can only imagine. It is, moreover, so fragile in imagining that it is readily crushed by the high-powered impact of technologies of data projection that are designed to sell us things rather than to enhance our awareness or our powers of observation. And what these technologies are telling us in conference rooms just like this, located all around the world, furnished with exactly the same equipment, with blinds drawn to cut out the light, and populated by globe-trotting international experts. What they're telling us is that the environment is not at all as I have just described it, or as, or as we might find it were we to take a walk outdoors. It's rather a world whose reality is given quite independently of our experience of it, and that we can know only through the compilation of data sets drawn from detached observation and measurement, and relayed back in the forms of maps, graphs and images. It's apprehended as a globe with its atmosphere, rather than a manifold of earth and sky, as a catalogue of biodiversity, rather than the entangled lifeways of animals and plants, as susceptible to climatic change, rather than the vicissitudes of weather. Now, for most people, the environment of everyday life is understood in the first sense. It is what we tend to call the world around us, extending from where we are to the horizon with the earth below and the sky above. Yet it is the second that predominates in the discourses of techno-science and policy-making. From this latter perspective, the relation between people and the world seems to be turned inside out. When scientists and policy-makers speak of the global environment, they have in mind a world that we have ourselves surrounded. Expelled to its outer surface, we have become exhabitants rather than inhabitants. In a world conceived as a globe, as philosopher Martin Heidegger once pointed out, there is nowhere for us human beings to be. The earth affords habitation, the globe does not. And while we may accept some responsibility for the global environment, it's not something to which we feel we can belong. How then can we respond to the prognostications of science? How can we act to safeguard the future of a globalised world that in our experience has already been taken from us? I don't mean to imply that we should turn a blind eye to the changes, largely induced by human activity, which threaten the continuity of life in many regions of the planet. But I believe that the proper way to address this threat and to secure the continuity of a world fit for both humans and non-humans to live in is to close the gap that currently exists between the experienced environment of our everyday lives, that is, the world around us, and the projected environment of science and policy discourse. And at present it seems to be the gap is becoming ever wider. And for the discipline of anthropology, caught as it is betwixt these contrary understandings and committed to mediating between them, 
this poses an, an acute challenge. To begin to close the gap, the first step is to bring it out into the open and recognize its existence. And the second is to acknowledge that the environment of lived experience is just as real, if not more so, than the one described by science, and that the wisdom, sensitivity and judgment of inhabitants offers just as valid a basis for securing the continuity of life as do the models, predictions and scenarios of scientists. Far from abandoning science, however, or opposing the knowledge of inhabitants to scientific knowledge, we need to find ways to, to, in which they can work together. And this calls for both a revaluation of the environmental experience and creative interventions of lay practitioners, and a, an acknowledgement that science and technology too are grounded in practices of habitation. Now at present, with rather, exception, with, with, with rather rare exceptions, this is not happening. The reasons for the failure are not philosophical, they are political. They lie in the overwhelmingly greater power of the neoliberal state and corporate industry to enlist institutionalized science in the pursuit of their global interests. Interests that in the language of large corporations more often than not pass under the rubric of sustainable development. The calculus of sustainability is one that treats entire tracts of the Earth's surfaces, surface and the resources they harbour as standing reserves for the continuing benefit of a globally distributed humanity, much as one might administer a trust fund for future generations. It is to protect the Earth in the same way that the company protects its profits. This is not a question of personal care based on familiarity and experience, but of bookkeeping and rational management, of balancing recruitment and loss in renewables, just as one might balance monetary income and expenditure. In short, sustainability is premised upon a perspective of ex-habitation. By and large, the management of sustainability has made it more difficult, and not less, for the vast majority of people on the planet who have access neither to corporate power nor to the wealth that goes with it, do inhabit the earth. Their lands, or the rights to use them, have in many cases been curtailed or confiscated. They have been divested of both the responsibility of care for their environment and the power to exercise it. And their knowledge has been reduced to evidence, answering to systems of governance and regulation not of their own making, but imposed from above by more powerful interests. Thus, scientific and inhabitant knowledge occupy two poles in a hierarchy of power, with science at the top and inhabitants at the bottom. They are like the two bulbs of an hourglass, where the flow is unilaterally from the top down, rather than the bottom up. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should invert the glass, Today, more than ever, our actions in the world need to be informed by a science of the environment. But we need to put the glass on its side, to give equal weight to the knowledge and wisdom of both practicing environmental scientists and inhabitants. For scientists are inhabitants too. Their studies are not just of the environment, but are carried out in an environment. All science depends on observation, and observation depends on the same sensitivity and judgment in relation to the world around us that is key to the practices of inhabitants, be they scientists, farmers, foresters, fishers, hunters, or anyone else whose livelihoods are inextricably bound to the lands and oceans of our one earth. This rootedness of scientific inquiry in our habitation of the earth its general messiness and incoherence, is something to be celebrated, not suppressed. We need to turn the relation between people and environment back again, from inside out to outside in. Only by doing so, by founding a science of the environment upon a foundation that lets us be in the world we seek to know and understand, rather than expelling us from it, only then can scientific knowledge 
and the wisdom of inhabitants meet in the common project of designing environments for life. Now before suggesting how this might be done, I need to say a few words about the meaning of life itself. For my contention is that the same logic that has cast humans on the outside of a globe has put life on the inside of the creatures that populate its surface. Life has come to be identified with an interior principle installed from the moment of conception at the heart of every organism whence it orchestrates that organism's growth and development in an environment. The essence of life, in short, is supposed to lie in the genes. And according to what many students are told is the first law of biology, every living thing is the product of an interaction between genes and environment, that is, between a received set of interior specifications and the exterior conditions of existence. In a celebrated passage of The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin imagined himself observing the plants and bushes clothing an entangled bank. It's a compelling image. In the tangled bank, lines of growth issuing from multiple sources become comprehensively bound up with one another, just as do the vines and creepers of a dense patch of tropical forest. It was not, however, in these bindings, in these interweavings of trajectories or growth, that Darwin sought the unity of life. It was rather in the principle of common ancestry. And ever since Darwin, the mainstream scientific conception of the unity of life has been genealogical. It is said that we share our world with other creatures because, or to the extent that, we are related to them along lines of descent from putative common ancestors. However, an understanding of the unity of life in terms of genealogical relatedness is bought at the cost of cutting out every single organism from the relational matrix in which it lives and grows. In this understanding, life presents itself to our awareness not as the interlacing of the tangled bank, but rather as an immense scheme of classification, nowadays going by the name of biodiversity, in which every individual is assigned to a spe specific taxon, such as species or genus, on the basis of virtual attributes that it is deemed to possess by virtue of genetic transmission independently and in advance of its life in the world. Well, if the unity of life can be understood in genealogical terms only by treating every living thing as a virtual object, abstracted from the world it inhabits, then how does modern thought understand the unity of the world? I've already suggested the answer to life excised from the world. The world presents itself not as a ground of habitation, but as a surface to be occupied. Whereas in a chart of phylogenetic descent, living things are arrayed on the axis of time, on the surface of the world they are arrayed on the coordinates of space, the first giving us the opposition between the particular and the general, the second the opposition between the local and the global. Still today, the phylogenetic tree diagrams of biological taxonomy coexist with images of the world as a solid globe surrounded by space. In short, the mode of apprehension that would reveal the totality of living things as a catalogue of biodiversity is also one that reveals the world as a globe in the purview of a universal humanity. The tree and the globe are complementary images. Each, indeed, presupposes the other. And together, globe and tree make up the two great domains of nature, the inorganic and the organic, upon which humanity is said to have added the superorganic layer of society. Writing of the concept of society, the anthropologist Eric Wolfe reminds us that it is far from a mere label, 
under which we may subsume certain objective groupings of human beings or creatures of other species whose members are held to share some common bond. Assertions about the existence of society and the manner of its constitution, Wolf insists, are not simple statements of fact of the way things are. They are rather claims advanced and enacted in order to construct a state of affairs. Throughout the last few centuries of European and American history, numerous and often conflicting claims have been advanced in the name of society, each however motivated by a vision of future equilibrium that would finally balance the needs and desires of human individuals with their conditions of mutual coexistence. The ever-changing upshot of the coercive enactment of these claims, alternately murderous and monumental, is the messy world we now live in. It's a world where, rather as in a modern city, structures dating from different periods and driven by different finalities jostle for space, while inhabitants pick their way as best they can between them, turning every closure into an opening for the continuation of their own life histories. Of course, for as long as people have been carrying on in the company of others, social life has been proceeding. But it has not always proceeded under the rubric of society. What is perhaps most distinctive about life conducted under this rubric is the experience of having to weave a path through a medley of structures built by others for you to live in, according to designs that answer not to your particular background and circumstances, but to some general conception of pan-human needs. For as Wolf says, the concept of society, wherever and whenever it has been unloosed upon the world, and this has always been at specific times and places, has been aggressive in its claim to universality for all times and everywhere. Now my reason for introducing these reflections on society is that much of what applies to the concept also applies to the concept of nature. Indeed the two concepts share a common history in which they have been often paired, whether as analogues or opposites. No more than the concept of society does nature signify the brute facticity of the world, or what is objectively out there regardless of the endeavours and aspirations of those who have resort to the term. Assertions about the existence and constitution of nature, as of society, are claims, and the aggressive pursuit of these claims by agents with sufficient coercive power to impose their vision can greatly affect the circumstances under which people have to lead their lives. These claims have been many and various, ranging from the original invocation of an uncultivated commons as terra nullius, which opened the door to colonial expropriation of the lands of indigenous peoples, to the contemporary appeal of ecological restoration that would see the landscape revert to some image of what it was before humans arrived on the scene. If there's a difference between claims advanced in the name of nature and those advanced in the name of society, it is that the former are more retrospective than prospective, more concerned to establish a universal point of origin for humanity than a final destination. In reality, of course, just as people have forever carried on their lives in the fields of their entanglements with others, so also they have inhabited an environment including manifold, non-human, as well as human constituents. Social life has always been part and parcel of ecological life, if indeed the two can be sensibly distinguished at all. It is a peculiarity of life lived under the rubric of society, however, that relations with non-humans are construed to lie on the far side, in a world of primordial potentialities, rather than instituted finalities. Not only then do the inhabitants of society have to find their way through the maze of conclusions that various times have offered to history, 
they also have to piece together the many alternative presentations of origin that may be glimpsed on the other side, each going by the name of nature and each claiming a timelessness and universality particular to its age and place. All of this goes to show that the concept of nature, like that of society, is inherently and intensely political. It is invariably bound up in a politics of claim and counterclaim whose outcome depends upon the prevailing balance of power. Yet, even when configured by the institutions of society, the life of human beings is not carried on in a world of its own, beyond the edge of another world of nature wherein the lives of all non-humans are contained. Rather, all creatures, human and non-human, are fellow passengers in the one world in which they all live, and through their activities continually create the conditions for each other's existence. It may be true that throughout the world, humans have decisively influenced the conditions under which other creatures live their lives. But an environment is always work in progress, and among its producers must be included every agent that contributes in one way or another to its formation. Human beings, certainly, but also animals of virtually every other kind, as well as plants and fungi, the wind and rain, rivers and the ocean. Of course, their relative contributions vary greatly, both geographically and over time. My point, however, is that an environment that has been prominently shaped by human activity, a garden, say, or a cultivated field, or a dwelling house, is on that account no more artificial, no more of a construction, than one that shows no signs of human presence at all. It's just that the principal producers are different in each case. Nor, since the process of production did not begin with the arrival of humans, and indeed has no discernible point of origin, nor is one environment any less natural than another. Human social life is therefore not cut out on a separate plane, over and above that of nature, but is part and parcel of a process that is going on throughout the organic world, comprised of the interplay of diverse human and non-human beings in their mutual entanglement. But if beings can foster each other's development, they can also act to block it, by removing or subverting the conditions of growth. History brings pain and suffering, as well as growth and prosperity. Neither is the monopoly of, human, of humans or of non-humans. That humans regularly inflict pain and suffering on other humans, not to mention non-humans, is all too obvious. But it is worth bearing in mind that a great deal of the distress of non-humans is attributable to other non-humans and that humans can suffer at the hands, or teeth, or claws, of non-humans too. Perhaps the infliction is less deliberate, but it is no less real in its consequences. How then can we rethink the environment in a way that gives priority to inhabitation, in a way that lets humans and other creatures be? We could make a start by rethinking the organism itself. Among many indigenous peoples, it is said that plants walk just as people do. And if thus this sounds strange to us, it is only because we have a different understanding of movement. We think of movement as the displacement of an already completed object from one location to another. Animals move, we admit, but plants surely stay put, rooted to the earth. But what if movement were rather a way of issuing forth along a line of growth? When plant roots grow, their tips issue forth, leaving a trail behind them. And the same happens in indigenous understanding when people walk along. The wind, too, leaves a trail as it blows, and the sun as it makes its way across the sky. Everything follows its particular path. Perhaps then we should describe the organism not as a self-contained bounded object, but as a line, 
or better, a whole bundle of lines, that continually overflow any boundaries we might draw around it. Even Darwin, steeped as he was in the traditions and prejudices of Western thought, was not so far from this view in his observation, to which I have already referred, of the entangled bank. But in a tangle of root systems, such as is often exposed along a bend in a river where the current undercuts the wooded bank on one side, how can we possibly draw a line around any tree so as to separate it from its environment? Indeed, the environment itself might be better understood as a zone of entanglement. Within the tangle of interlaced trails or fibres, continually ravelling here and unravelling there, organisms grow or issue forth along the lines of their relationships. Nevertheless, human history, and above all the history of the Western world, is studied with coercive attempts to suppress the unruly meanderings of inhabitants, both human and non-human, by covering over the tangle they weave with an infrastructure of hard and impervious surfaces. Engineered roads now crisscross the lands of indigenous peoples, crushing their trails of life in the name of sustainable forestry. All around the world, governments and corporations have caused banks once entangled with vegetation to be bulldozed to clear space for highways, airstrips, power lines and industrial complexes. To an ever-increasing extent, the surfaced world has become a solid substratum for the enactment of a global drama. It is a world that can be occupied but not inhabited. Colonial life, encapsulated in mobile vehicles as genes are in bodies, rolls over this world rather than threading through it. The effect of hard surfacing is to enforce a rigid separation between the earth below and the air above, a separation long built into science itself in the disciplinary separation of meteorology from terrestrial ecology and in the global distinction of the biosphere from the atmosphere. It's this separation, as I've shown, that forces scientists to look inside the organism for the impulse of life and to find it in the genes rather than, say, in the humdrum and well-known reaction of photosynthesis. Yet without photosynthesis there could be no life on Earth. Nor could there be life without the fungi and bacteria that decompose organic material for recycling as nutrients for further growth. Both reactions bind Earth, air and water across a permeable zone of interpenetration known to experience as the ground. Where interpenetration is blocked by hard surfacing, neither photosynthesis nor decomposition can occur. And indeed, in a fully surfaced world, nothing could grow at all. Thinking of the environment from the perspective of habitation as a zone of entanglement which disrupts any boundary we might draw between the interiority of the organism and the exteriority of the world gives us a way of situating the lived experience of engaging with our surroundings within the dynamics of the more encompassing systems of which these engagements are a part. This is to make a start, at least, in closing the gap between the earth-sky world of our experience and the global environment of techno-science. And with this, I contend, we can take the first and most necessary step in designing environments for life. Thank you very much.